to the shingle. On personal health, safety, we have one grounding rod. Now's a good time to see if it sags. Okay, I just checked this. We have two hots in the ground. So you need to look at things like that. Our flame colors look good. Electricity and water, not a good combination. We want to look and see what our service wires are. Here we're using aluminum. And, uh, lateral bracing, we have lateral bracing. Hi, I'm Jim Crum, owner of Colorado's Best Home Inspections. We're going to do an inspection today on this house here. Uh, we're just pulling up. It's kind of a training inspection right now. We're going to walk you through what we do, how we treat our clients, and how we treat a home inspection. Uh, this is a truck. We bring about $15,000 worth of gear to every inspection. Uh, we never know what we're going to need. Sometimes we need a moisture meter. Sometimes we have a radon test. Uh, you need to have your equipment with you accessible, clean. Your truck needs to be clean. Every time it's dirty, we show up at a car wash before the inspection. You should be the first one at the house. Your clients don't want to wait for you. The agents don't want to wait for you. Fifteen minutes uh, early is considered late in my business. Uh, that's called Lombardi time. But uh, if you make that habit, you don't have to make the phone calls. In the four years we've been in business, I've been late for inspections twice. My clients were aware of it before it happened. You know, if you do that, remember, it's a courtesy. They're using you, they're paying you. Usually they didn't meet you before the inspection. First impressions are everything. If you're clean, your truck is clean, it goes a long ways. Okay, when we pull up, first thing we do is take a couple pictures of the front of the house. Uh, we use digital cameras. We, my company takes 81 photos if there's not a problem with the house. I've never found a house yet that didn't have a problem. We average 130 to 200 photos. Uh, we don't only give our clients the defects. We don't give them all those photos. They're in our archives for seven years. If this client calls me in two years and wants to know something about the house, I can go back to the photos. If one of my other inspectors does an inspection, he's out of town, he's not around to ask the questions or answer the questions, I need to look at those photos and be able to figure out what he looked at. If we need to go back and meet the client as a courtesy, that's also included in our inspections. You walk up to the house, we're looking at things like grading, uh, drainage, trip hazards. Right off the bat, I notice two things. We have trees touching the house and we have a trip hazard at the sidewalk right here. Uh, may not be a real big deal to you, but if they have an elderly guest or if they are elderly and they trip, it's going to be a big deal. So as we come up here, I'll take a picture. Anything over three quarters of an inch is a trip hazard. That's a trip hazard. And this is a trip hazard. So what's that tell us? Colorado concrete movement is pretty normal. Uh, doesn't mean it's still safe. It's also talking about a drainage problem. Right here, we're dumping a downspout. Yes, it's five foot away from the house, but it's also dumping right at this sidewalk here. So that's going to contribute to our, to our movement issue. We're going to settle here. Here we've raised a little bit. It's going to be a trip hazard, and it's going to be a continual trip hazard unless we move this down spot out away from the house. This tree here, it's planted too close to the property. Anything within 10 foot can cause foundation problems. The other issue, it's going to plug the gutters, and it's going to hit the roof and the siding. You know, trying to get a client to remove a tree that they like like that doesn't always work. All we can do is make recommendations. There is no pass or fail in this business. Our clients kind of determine what is pass off our report. They're entrusting you for one of their most expensive purchases in their life. And so it's your job to tell them, to educate them what they're buying, and then it's their job to decide what they want to do to fix it or if they still want to continue buying the house. So we're going to walk around here, look at several things. Right here, we're bringing the water out away from the house. Then we have a low spot on the soil right here, so we're bringing the water right back into the house. Soil slope, we, we'd like at least a 5% grade away from the house at all areas. Here we have about, my guess is a 3 or 4% grade into the house. That's not going to do much for our foundation. We have a sprinkler system here. They're not part of a standards of practice, but my company runs them as a courtesy whenever possible. We'll pop them off. We, I explain to my clients that 
we have some dark spots doesn't mean you won't have to adjust things but if they don't work we know they're not functional uh, if there's major leaks we know they're not functional I can't see inside the ground so that's why we're doing a basic function test as a courtesy and it's not part of a standards of practice we also have an open window well here we have two problems with an open window well one is a safety issue kids pets anything like that can fall in it the other issue we have is up until recently we didn't have drainage uh, systems in the window wells if we get a big snow we can fill it up then we start to melt then when it freezes we can blow out that window or we can just cause moisture problems in the uh, basement crawl space whatever it will be so we want to get window well covers on there over here the same issue we have a negative grade towards the house this downspout extension right here yeah we're bringing the water away from the house now we're bringing it right back into the house so grading's an issue here we always want to keep our dirt six inches from the siding we have some room here to bring it up we may not be able to get our full five percent but we'd at least have a positive degree away from the house which is ultimately what we need to have our main service here we have one grounding rod this house is old enough we should have a grounding rod and we should have a cold water ground uh, 2003 to 2005 we started using you for systems then we'll find a piece of rebar inside that has a ground on it always needs to be exposed always needs to have an access panel to it uh, we're gonna look when we take a look at the panel inside we wanna make sure that it's adequate for what our client wants to do ask some questions find out how many people are gonna live in the house this window well becomes more of an issue if they have two and three year old kids than if it's a middle-aged couple that doesn't have any kids so we're going to look at things like that. This here, somebody's been into it, they just didn't close it up right. You want to make sure that the locks are on here. Public service can put a fine if there's no locks on there and they come out. They think somebody might be flipping the meter upside down. Your client doesn't want to pay a fine for a past problem, so you can always request that they have the locks put back on. I'm under the assumption this is a brick veneer, which most houses here are at this age. We should have weep holes every 33 inches. We get moisture behind this, we want a way to get it out. We have pretty good soft foot overhangs. I'm seeing no weep holes at all here. With the overhangs, it's going to be a minor problem, not terrible. They can be added afterwards. I would definitely make sure that we have some kind of flashing good caulking up here at this point because if that gutter overspills we're gonna have water come back in the back side there we have no weep holes here we have the potential for a problem there with getting mold behind the wall so with this tree here we know we're already gonna have leaves there so it's just advising your client that okay this could be an area of potential concern are we gonna redo this whole house probably not but you want to make sure you keep the caulking in good shape keep the gutters clean flash the areas that you can flash to take care of that problem. We would have liked to seen a one inch gap on this trim here just so that we don't have the, the same problem that happens over on this other side. We have a little air gap here, we're not bad. On the other side you can see the paint is deteriorated because we're having water contact on it and it's weeping up just like a candle. Uh, are they going to do anything about it? Probably not. Uh, next time somebody's working with the trim though they could easily cut off an inch of that. <clears throat> Here we're missing the downspot extension. We also have a flower bed right next to the uh, foundation. It is the garage so it's not as critical as if it was the house but we're still going to hold water there. We're going to have more of a chance for our garage slab to move. Uh, anytime we have the water around the foundation, it's a bad idea. We should at least put that extension down there and minimize our watering here. Overgrown landscaping back here. Uh, 
eventually that will cause siding damage or damage to that window trim. Uh, we want to cut them back. That one right there, it's really not serving much of a purpose. I don't think you'd get a big hassle if you told people to remove it. It is within 10 foot. The best thing would be to make it go away. We take a lot of pictures. As you notice, I've probably taken 20 or 30 pictures already. It's your memory. I don't use reporting that I use take with me all the time. I do have a tablet in the truck and we'll probably take it out a little bit later because there's not a client here. But if a client's with me, I usually don't do on-site reporting because I like to talk to them. The photos is my memory. I write the report. I walk the same routine every house. If you do nothing else, get nothing else out of today, just remember every house should be inspected identically. If it's an 8,000 square foot house or an 800 square foot house, if you use the same pattern, you don't forget things. We don't miss a fireplace. We don't miss this panel because we do it the same order. All these photos, I write the reports at night usually, proof them in the morning. I go back after I write the report and check my photos. About every tenth inspection I find, okay, I didn't put this in and that photo reminds me. Uh, or when the client calls me in two years, I do 500 inspections a year. My other our agents each do about 400. So that is our memory in two years from now. Was the basement walls floating? I don't remember. Okay, I have a picture. No, they weren't floating and we talked about that. It helps you win in court for one thing. We've never been there, and I don't plan on going there. More of it than anything, it's a courtesy to your clients so you can give them continued service. We keep all our information for seven years. That's a long time to remember a house. When we're looking at a concrete driveway, we have expansion joints. When we have weeds growing through them, it tells us we've already cracked, which is what it's there for. It isn't there to let moisture in, though. Here we could put caulk, just like they put this deteriorated caulk here. If we caulk this, we get less chance of movement because we have less moisture going in there. Uh, is it a huge issue? Well, not really. It's a maintenance issue that should be done every, every year, every couple of years. Uh, in Colorado, all of it, like I said, all of our concrete does move. That's why we put those in there. Uh, there's no trip hazards out here, so it's just an annual. Let, let's put some sealant on there. Let's try to minimize what we have for movement. You just step into the backyard, notice a few things. Right off the bat, the gate doesn't close properly. Usually that's a fairly minor repair, but it's an indication we have movement. On this one, the gate would have to be shaved. If you have a single client, maybe they're not handy, maybe they can't do that. It's your jo not your job to tell them what needs to be fixed or when it needs to be fixed, but it's your job to educate them on what they're buying so they can decide if it's a big deal to them. Another issue with this tree again, way too close. Besides damaging the roof up here, we have big potential for it to damage the foundation. Uh, people talk about aspens, the root systems don't cause damage. I've seen houses where the foundation wall is completely cracked and moved three inches from an aspen about this distance away. That tree's not going to get any smaller. Uh, it's going to cost more money to re remove it down the road after it does the damage. Let's try and get it removed now. Same thing here with this extension. It's laying right there. They put a splash back there. Well, that splash back would probably work a lot better if it graded this way instead of back into the house. Soil, mainly a positive grade here. This isn't too bad. <clears throat> if somebody uses this walkway a lot, the way these flagstones have just been dropped on here, it's a trip hazard. This one up here, we have a couple inches. Somebody could easily stub their toes on there. <clears throat> if it's just used as occasional, people don't walk back through here, a gate to bring the trash out, maybe not such a big deal. Okay, looking at the back of the house, we see the same thing with the, uh, the window well here. Especially if you bring in little kids or pets, that so sooner or later somebody's going to fall into that. Besides the snow water problems, it's just a safety issue. We're starting to get some movement here. This could be brought up, the whole end's coming up. We actually need to put some sand into the back side of this, this flagstone here to keep it flat. Flagstone is not a low maintenance, no maintenance type of uh, covering. 
talk to your clients about that. It's like you're going to have to do some leveling, especially every spring. We're going to see some movement. It's beautiful. Looks nice. They did a very good job on it. It does take some annual upkeep, though. This is a pretty good example right here of what happens when we have vegetation contact in a house. The paint's in good shape here, paint's in good shape here. Where this hits, we've taken off the paint. Going to get accelerated wood rot. The way they finger jointed this here, any wood in there is going to split this. Any water in there is going to split that. And we will end up having to replace that trim. Not a terrible deal but I don't want to do it at my house. Point out we have open windows. Open windows are great, especially when they're on the second floor, not a real security issue. But we do have to talk, if we're going to do a radon test, now is the time to tell them, okay, we're seeing open windows right now. We were going to do a radon test. Well, we have to be 12 hours closed house conditions. I personally will use continuous monitors so I could just not count the first 12. But if you're using canisters, electrics, anything else, now you have to come back to this house on a second trip just to set it. So that means you're going to be here three times. With gas at what it is right now, that becomes an issue. Uh, I don't want to drive to the house three times if I can afford it because it costs me about 25 bucks each time I show up. Uh, so talk about that, explain the options. Do you have enough time? Do we still have the 48 hours? Were the sellers aware that they were supposed to have closed house conditions? Anything you can do like that will speed up your process, actually make you money in the long run because you won't be wasting money. This here, this is how we'd like to have it. I can see we have some blockage in here, some leaves in here. But we have an extension, then we ha have a splash back. This is about perfect. This water will go away from the house. We won't have a problem with it. This corner of the house will probably never see movement if we keep it like that. When you're inspecting a house, we go around a house several times, looking at different elevations. I usually start low looking at grading issues, things like that. Work my way up, look at the upper level windows, things like that, trying to find fogging. Uh, we don't put a ladder up against the siding, second floor windows, third floor windows, things like that for several reasons. One, it's safety hazard. We don't have anything real straight here to, to put a ladder on. We have no place to tie off. Two, if it's stucco, especially if it's stucco, we can damage the, uh, the finish and now we didn't have a problem and then two years from now we're gonna have a problem. I have bin binoculars. Uh, the camera has zoom on it. There's lots of ways to handle that. Sometimes you just have to talk to clients and say, hey, that area is unsafe. I can't get up there to look at it. It looks a little iffy or it looks good. You need to explain to the client your limitations. Uh, you can't look at everything. We're here for a short time. We're here three to four hours on a home inspection. Will we see everything in this house? No. Will we catch everything? Probably not. Our goal is to, but we're not Superman. We can't see inside. We can't. It's a visual non-destructive inspection. I can't take an all and start beating up the siding or the window trim because now I caused a problem and then you're going to get a call back from the seller saying, hey, my siding looked great, now you have holes in it. So you need to explain your limitations, do the best you can. If you have a client with you, which is what I prefer, then they see how hard you work. They know you earned your money. It's like, wow, I, I didn't know there was so much involved in this. Then you have less of a chance for them to say, yeah, that third story window, it wasn't cocked on the top. And it's like, well, no, I couldn't see that. We talked about that, remember? It's like, oh yes, I do remember that now. And it's like, you know, we can't completely eliminate the risk of owning a house. They have their due diligence, they have to do too. You're just one part of it. Come back here. We have trash, landscaping debris. Uh, there is a thing called spontaneous combustion. Uh, you can have fires without a flame source. The sun hits this pretty good, as you can see. We could end up with a fire just from this pile here. It happens all the time. Uh, defensible space. This house isn't in the mountains, but you need to look at that. What can we do? Uh, any place in Colorado is at risk. We're always in a desert. What can you do to defend this space? Well, right here, you can clean this out. Clear the clutter. Get the grading proper. 
uh, you'll have less chance for raccoons, skunks, rodents, things like that, and your house will look a whole lot nicer. We're looking right here. We see some bowed siding. Pretty much just not nailed. Whenever you see an issue like that, you have to start looking at your sprinkler system. Is the sprinklers hitting the siding? This siding, like right here, the drip edge is very susceptible to moisture damage. Uh, this looks like fresh air, probably for a uh, fireplace. If it was a dryer vent, we're dumping moist air here. This would be really rotted. Okay, what's this tell us? Uh, tells us that it really needs to be painted. The paint's deteriorated. The house looks pretty good. The chimney's the biggest problem. Uh, what they really should do is paint the drip edge before they spray the house. That way we have an adequate amount of paint and this siding will last as it's intended for a long time. If we don't keep up on the paint and we're catching sun, it's going to deteriorate and this siding will be worn out in about five years. So that gets pretty expensive. I don't want to buy siding. The fence here, we need to have some repairs. Uh, I usually explain to my clients that we're doing a home inspection. We're not doing a property inspection. Uh, if they want us to do a property inspection, I have no problem doing that, but it's going to cost you a little bit more. Uh, doing a visual, shaking a couple fence posts is great. I can see all these fence posts back here are rotted out. The fence is leaning. You know what? We're going to have to do some repairs. Am I going to tell them how much? No. They may decide they want a whole different kind of fence in there, but the fence and the gates both need repair. Compost pile, here is what it looks like. We really don't want a compost pile that close to the house. Back corner of the lot would be much better for uh, both smells, health, fire hazard. You can see here we had a doggy door, some kind of door. Uh, it's blocked up. When we get on the inside, we'll take a better look at that, see if it's a security issue. Can they get in? Can they get in any farther? We look up above us here. We have, we're starting to come back, so we're going to look at different elevations. We have this window is fogged. You can see the screen isn't on there, right? But there's a lot of fogging between the dual pane glass. Okay, that means we need at least one window. This one here probably isn't fogged now because we have this tree in front of it. Kind of a double-edged sword there. Uh, it's protecting the window, but it's not doing much for the siding. This window up here may be fogged. From the inside, we'll look at that a little bit closer. Uh, the others seem to be getting a pretty good shade, so they're probably not going to be. The overall siding is in pretty good shape. I like to tell my clients pluses and minuses. I don't just pick apart the house, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. Let's show some pretty good things, too. Uh, you're trying to give an unbiased opinion of the whole house, not just defects. Uh, your report's going to focus on the defects. When you're walking around, it's a good time to point out, you know, this is beautiful landscaping. Let's look at this. Or you need to do this kind of maintenance, but it still is pretty. Coming back to the stairs, you can see they've settled a little bit. And we're pretty high on the soil next to the siding right here. Are they going to fix it? That's not your call. You're going to bring it out. You're going to talk to them about it. That way they can, okay, we can keep an eye on this. We may have to jack up the stairs. We may have to dig this dirt away from the siding, things like that. It's just your job to educate them on the house. This sprinkler head, it doesn't really serve much of a purpose other than watering the foundation. Probably a good reason that the step's starting to settle here because we just keep watering it. Uh, that sprinkler head should be capped and taken away. It really has no purpose on the house here. When I'm walking around the house looking at the eaves and the soffits, I look for bees' nests. Uh, we get a lot of beehives here. You know, 80% of the homes I look at have bees. 
you need to talk to your client just briefly about it. You don't need to focus on it, but if they're allergic to bees, they would re really like to know that there's a beehive up there. Uh, this one here has been pretty clean so far. We do see a lot of it, though, so just something to be aware of. If you're allergic to bees, you definitely want to be aware of it. Your sprinkler system here. Now that we walked around the yard, it's pretty, pretty good calibration judge of how high it is. It should be 18 inches minimum above all sprinkler heads for it to work properly. I've just been in the backyard, realized this is a pretty level lot. Can kind of look over by the driveway. That's probably the highest spot. We're roughly 18 inches. Are we going to take a transit and check it? No. But we want to be aware that if it's laying on the ground and the backyard is higher than it, it can cause problems. It's not going to work properly. So things like that, look at, talk about. You are your client's knowledge. The more educated you can get on this, the better job you can do. Standards of practice are a beginning point, in my opinion. That's the minimum we should do. Sometimes we can't see the yard. There's three foot of snow in here. Okay, well then, if we talk about that, say, okay, I can't check the landscaping right now because we have too much snow. But when spring comes, look at this. Make sure it's above your, uh, your sprinkler heads, things like that. Uh, they're going to continue to live in this house for 10, 15 years. The more you tell them, the more they can think about, uh, the better off you are and the better off they are. Over here, we have loose piece of siding. It's pretty easy to nail it up there now. Uh, when the wind gets it and rips off that piece and two others, it isn't real easy to fix. Right now, it's a very simple job. Let's nail that down, caulk it, make sure that it doesn't go anywhere, and then it'll give you years of trouble-free uh, living. Up at the, the gable here at the peak, we can see a, a beehive. We were just talking about that a little bit ago. Uh, it's up there quite a bit. If it was on the garage, it'd be a little bit more of a hazard for your client. But then again, just explain to them that, yeah, you do have bees here. If you're allergic to them, maybe you should get this house sprayed so we don't have a problem with that. Uh, you don't really you want to go take a stick and start knocking them down uh, unless you like to get stung. But uh, just educate them. That is what your job is here. I'm going to get my ladder. Get on the roof, look at different things. One of the first things I notice when I'm looking at the roof is we don't have uh, downspout, ex downspout extensions. Builders aren't required to put them on there. <clears throat> I talk to my clients and tell them that, you know, if you put extensions on there to the next gutter, you'll probably get seven more years out of those shingles. Uh, the, the gravel won't be washed away, not quite as susceptible to ice damming. So, especially if this looks like the north side of the house, you know, it'd be a good idea for 20 bucks. You can put extensions on there, kind of minimize your, your problems. Safety is pretty important in our business. Ask anybody who stepped off a roof or had their ladder slip. Uh, you don't make any money when you're not working. Uh, buy a good ladder, class A. When you set your ladder, there's a good rule of thumb. If you can stand at the front of the ladder and put your hands and just touch the rings, you have about the right slope. A straight up ladder and a ladder is folded down too far, they're not safe. If there's any question where you're putting it, you're not required to go on the roofs if it's unsafe. Yes, we would like it if we could go on every roof, and we do go on almost every roof. It's not worth getting yourself killed or hurt over by trying to get on that roof. We have binoculars, limitations. Put in your report, unable to inspect a roof due to height, due to conditions, due to safety. Your clients don't want to see you get hurt either. So pay attention. If you can't get a good stop or you're not quite comfortable, 
don't be afraid to tie off that ladder. Uh, ask your client, just put his foot here. Think about personal safety. Now is a good time to mention to your clients. We invite you to be part of this inspection. You can go everywhere with me but the roofs and the attics. Your insurance company doesn't want to see that client walking up the uh, ladder. If you don't talk to them about it, they may just assume they can come up there. They fall, then it's your problem. Uh, most clients aren't handy enough that they should be on a ladder at the second or third floor. Uh, so pay a little attention to that. A little bit of talking goes a long ways. This is a business, a social business. The more you talk, the more comfortable your client is, the more they get out of this inspection. Some clients want to sit and they don't want to be a part of the inspection. Well, that's their choice. But if they're with you, do yourself a favor and talk to them. Coming up here, when I get to a roof, one of the first things I do is I take a picture of the shingles, the side of them. That's my memory for how many layers of shingles I had. Was there two? Was there three? <clears throat> Some municipalities now are going to every roof is a tear off. You can't do two or three layers anymore. Almost all of Colorado has gone away from the three. So I try to tell them, okay, this roof should last you this long if you maintain it, if we have proper ventilation. When it needs to be replaced, it's going to be a complete tear off. So they're not shocked. First thing we're going to do right here, well, we know we have potential for a problem because this tree's been rubbing here. I can come down here, look, gutters are completely plugged. Okay, what other damage has happened? Has it rolled up into the uh, soffits and fascia already? At this point, we're looking pretty good. So I don't think it's caused a problem, uh, and we'd like to keep it that way by getting rid of this tree. Remember your personal safety. You can't finish the inspection if you fall. We're looking at flashing here and that our siding is cut away from the, uh, the roofing. This is about perfect here. An inch is acceptable. We get less than that, we're going to get the weeping. We want to keep this siding in as good a shape as possible. I use the same routine when I'm walking a roof. I always have a clockwise rotation. That way you don't miss a section of the roof. In case there's a spongy, this roof looks pretty good shape. Do we know how old it is? Well, not right off. Could have it been put over some bad wood? We don't know until we step on it. Be careful. I've had ridge boards fail on a house with a brand new roof. Uh, if I wasn't walking carefully, I probably would have fallen through that roof. So pay attention. We have venting. <clears throat> we want venting. Soffit venting and uh, ridge venting. If we don't have enough vents, the shingles aren't going to last. They're going to boil from the inside out. Talk to your client about things like that. Another gutter that's completely plugged. So this is also going to contribute to that problem with the steps down here because the downspout's not far enough away and now no water can get through the downspout. Put your hands on the vents, wiggle them, pull them. Sometimes in the attic they'll be a little loose, which is okay, but I've had several where I take and I turn and they're not connected to anything. Somebody either forgot to glue them or they're just not hooked them. we're letting water go into that attic. Here I can see some slight damage from, from this, probably before they trimmed it. You can just see it rubbed. It hasn't hurt anything yet. You know, let's try and keep it that way. The way they put this gutter in right here, it's sitting higher, and the way they've cut this siding, now the water that comes off the side of it is going on the inside of our wood there. This area is susceptible to a problem. What should we do there? Well, it's not your repair, but a flashing would go a long way to keep water from getting inside that soffit. Uh, little things are, it's pretty much maintenance. All these things should be taken care of once in a while. Um, is it a big deal? No, until you have to replace the soffit because it's water damaged.
This roof feels good. It looks good. Now we're looking at the second level roof. Okay, how are you going to get up there? Remember safety. You can't go up there if you can't do it safely. Don't take the chances. Don't go to the very top of your ladder. I can climb on. I can do it this way. You know, sooner or later it's going to bite you and you're going to get hurt. Uh, if you fall off this, fall off here, you're going to be hurt or dead. So you don't want to do that. I'm going to go down, grab another ladder. I'll be coming right up. Now you need to be careful. This isn't the safest part of your job right now, bringing this ladder up. So pay attention. Don't be talking like I am right now. Uh, try and pay attention to what you're doing. You'll notice this is a much lighter ladder. If you're going to carry a ladder on a roof, you need a lightweight ladder to do it. Uh, I will not let anybody else use this ladder but me. Uh, it, isn't, it isn't a Class A, but I wouldn't feel safe carrying a Class A up another ladder like that. Um, this is kind of a last resort. We would prefer not to have to do this. But I'm also not carrying a 42 foot ladder with me every time I go out. So this is a judgment call. Whether you feel safe enough to do this or not. Okay. We made it up here. We have a vent here that's loose. It's pretty easy to just have a screw put in this to hold it down so that the wind can't lift this off and damage it. If it's gone, it isn't doing any good at all. So, I'm going to make a recommendation for that. Let's check these. Look at your furnace flue. A lot of times we'll see cracking. This one's rusted. Can be an indication that we have a leak in there, but it's just on the very top. You're going to want to look at this real closely in the attic, though. If that rusting continues, we know we have a problem with the double wall, so it's carrying back through. So our outer wall is going to get hot, and it shouldn't get hot. <clears throat> look at that. A lot of times on the older houses, they'll be split and rusted in two. This is an indication of a problem farther down. So we need to look at that whole pipe if we can. Looking at our chimney. We have a screen on it. We have a rain cap. Two critical things. Helps keep the rodents out, raccoons out, uh, rain. We have some moisture damage siding. Most people never come up here. So this trim here could be nailed back down and tightened uh, and then repainted. Uh, you see the siding down here, the paint's deteriorated on it. Probably wasn't painted when the house was painted. Here again, we have roof venting, which we want to see. <clears throat> uh, if you come up to a house that doesn't have it, that's one of my biggest recommendations. You'll see it on a lot of my reports. You'll probably notice that I have dress shoes on, not work boots. They make a great roof shoe. They're flat. We don't damage the shingles as much as using a work boot. If you have a work boot that has contacts, you'll notice you mar the shingles more on a hot day. Today's 92 degrees, so we have a pretty good sun load. Um, pay attention to that. You don't want to cause a problem on a roof. If it's a tile, concrete tile roof, you need to know how to walk them. The house next door has wood shake roof. You need to be careful on those, uh, especially if it's damp at all. They'll be slippery. Uh, look at your safety. Can you safely walk this roof? Is the pitch safe to watch? This house doesn't have a tie-off. We have tie-off harnesses. Well, they work great, except for you still need to get up to the hook to tie off. So is it safe to go to that spot? If you have a low slope roof, you can tie off, and then you can look at the other roof. That's, that's something that is definitely feasible. Uh, you can do it safely. Go ahead and do it. Uh, I personally walk concrete tile roofs, uh, the Spanish tile roofs, slate roofs. You need to know what you're doing. You can easily cause more damage than what's there to begin with. If you do damage a tile, hold up to it. Pay to have it fixed. Don't just hope nobody will notice. Uh, you're not here to damage houses. It does happen, though. If you break something, tell somebody about it. Offer to fix it. That, that's the minimum you can do.
never walk backwards on a roof. That's a good way to fall off a roof. Even if you're in the middle of the roof and you think you're fine, if you trip, you may not end up on the outside, edge of the roof. I try to take pictures of all my roofs when I'm at the highest point. It's a memory. Okay, we can see right here on this dormer. We're raised up here. That part's higher than the others. That tells me we have a, a ice and water membrane underneath there. We want to see that. Older properties, you may not see that. We may have a metal flashing. There could be lots of ways to do it. When you see that, you can be pretty much assured that they've done their job correctly. This here gutter has a lot of mud in it. When we're seeing that, it makes us wonder about the slope. It makes us look at, okay, have we had hail damage? Do we have all our gravel in here? Maybe, well, start looking at this roof to see if it's whitewashed. Hail doesn't always look like holes. Uh, <clears throat> if it does have hail damage, this roof looks good. You have to uh, think about the insurance company. Will the insurance company insure this roof because we already have damage? Is it going to leak? Probably not. But it's not your call. Tell them there's some hail damage. Ask them to have their insurance company check it to cover yourself. It's like, you know... It's minor, but may, maybe you should call it out. I don't want to buy somebody a roof because there was too many hail dings and their insurance company wouldn't pay for it. Look at things like that. Overall, this is a good time to look at your yard. Look at the neighbor's yards. Look for safety issues. If you know your clients are going to have little kids, you have a 42-inch fence and you look next door and there's a big pool, well, then it's a safety issue for your kids. Uh, or for your clients kids if there's a water feature somewhere looks like it's over 18 inches deep well that's also a safety issue your job is to kind of point things out are they going to fix anything about it no but they'll keep a better eye on their kids maybe they'll put a bigger fence in uh, maybe they'll talk to the neighbors and the neighbors will realize they need to do something uh, you're kind of their their advocate here on personal health safety things like that Coming up on this roof, this is what I'm talking about, your downpipe, ex downspot extensions. If we took this and dumped it here, we wouldn't get the wash here. If you get ice here, it's going to start peeling these shingles. These shingles here won't last near as long as the rest of the house. It's pretty easy, two 10-foot sections, it's done. Uh, if you're not comfortable on the roof, then again, you may decide it's just not worth paying somebody to do. But if you're comfortable up here, it's an easy job. This is a good place to look at your window flashings. We have a metal flashing on top of this trim. Its job is to bring water away from it. Look and see that it's there. A lot of times you'll find second floor window, it got eliminated, they just didn't bother, uh, nobody's going to see it, uh, they can get away with it. That helps you determine what the rest of the windows are going to look like. Like I say, you can use binoculars. If I see problems here, then I may bring my ladder around to those other windows and take a look at them from a little higher up or I'm at least going to grab my binoculars and look at them very critically. Over here we should have a metal flashing on the back side of this. We do. That's what we want. If nothing else we need to have some kind of shingle rolled over. We don't want water getting in here and damaging the soffit either. From here I can see these windows all have flashing. Okay, looks like the builder did a pretty good job on that. When you take your ladder down, look for cars, look for clients. Always take it down safely. Uh, don't hurt yourself taking it down. You'll notice I put away my tools as soon as I'm done with them. One, you don't leave an expensive tool at a house. Two, nobody decides to take your ladder and go look at what you were just talking about. Nobody trips over your ladder. Uh, it's just a, a professionalism. If you look at tooling, 
we have a lot of uh, bank-owned properties now that don't have water. You'll notice there's a compressor in here. Several sets of hoses. I also do well inspections. So we need to be able to run water. The metal box up there has two of everything that you'll see me use today. I bring three sets of everything to the inspection. Uh, the only exception there is I have two tablets with me. If something gets broken, it's not really right for you to tell the client, well, can't check your water pressure because I broke my gauge at my morning inspection. When you're getting into the business, you can't afford all that stuff. But as you've been in the business a while, something starts to get worn, you retire that to your backup and you buy a new one. Uh, it's amazing how tools pay for themselves. Uh, if you come up looking good, looking professional, moisture meters, things like that, your business will grow with you. <clears throat> I have a chair there. That's not usually for my use. A lot of our bank owned properties, I have an older gentleman or older gal coming in. Usually there's two, one sitting on a deck that a client borrowed yesterday. I want him to have some place to sit down. Uh, an 80 year old gentleman looking at a house with me for three or four hours, that's an awful long day on your feet. Anything you can be courteous, uh, we, some people put floor mats at the house so they can clean their feet. We use inside and outside shoes and booties. Uh, remember, the seller doesn't know you. They're allowing you into your house. That is a courtesy. Uh, I'm not very comfortable letting people I don't know into my house. Try and maintain it. Leave it at least as clean as you can. You don't want to leave footprints. You don't want to make the house dirty. Your job here is the, the best case scenario is the client, the seller doesn't even know you were at their house. You come in, you leave, everything's exact. The only exception we make to that is if it's a health or a safety issue. If they leave the windows partway unlatched, I'll latch all the windows, especially main level windows. I don't want somebody to break into a house, have a single girl live in there and have a problem. Anytime you see a safety issue, take care of it, leave a note have the buyer's agent call the seller's agent. If you have a furnace that's unsafe, you need, it's, it's your job to let somebody know. No, they're not your client, but talk to your client and say, this is a safety issue. We have a disclosure. We do not disclose that report to anybody but our buyer and the agent. Uh, when it's a safety issue though, you have to ask for an, a, an amendment there so you can do it because you don't want somebody to die in a house you just inspected. You'd notice I wear gloves when I'm on the outside working with my ladders. Ladders have a tendency to get dirty. I don't want to walk into this house with dirty hands. There may not be soap. We may not have running water. Like I say, I want to keep this house as clean as it was when I got here, if not cleaner. So I put gloves on whenever I grab my ladders, whenever I have the potential to get dirty. I also have nitro gloves if it's a health type issue. Uh, that metal box in there has all that stuff. This here is a bottle of alcohol. I have alcohol in all my trucks. That way you can clean your hands, sanitize it. If you do come across a problem, yesterday we had a sewer back up. Uh, believe me, I cleaned my hands up afterwards. If you're going to take water samples, you need to sterilize your faucet or your hose bib. So it's a good idea just keep it rubbing alcohol uh, in your car, in your truck, just for those purposes. You don't know when you're going to need it. As you probably noticed, I wasn't taking notes when we did the inspection. That's what the camera's about. We do also use tablets. If the client isn't here, it's a great time to use your tablet. Punch off, you finish outside, you walk in the house, click off your report, or at least the major defects. Uh, if you have to do same-day reporting, these come in very handy. Our trucks are equipped with printers, everything that we need. Typically what we do is we email an inspection the next morning, and then we send them a hard copy. Uh, but this does speed up the job a lot. What it also works real good at, they pay for themselves in your downtime. You do an inspection in the morning, you go to lunch. You can click through your inspection, have most of it written, so that the next day all you have to do is proof it. Uh, I fought these for a long time, didn't want to spend the money when I was getting into business. It was one of the first things I should have bought. Uh, they just definitely pay for themselves. Uh, there's lots of different softwares. We're not going to go into whose is best, whose I use, who I prefer. Uh, consistency is the thing. When you start it, buy and try people's software. Get somebody you're comfortable with who you like their software because you want to stay with it for a while. 
your agents aren't going to like it if one week you use this software and the next week you have another software. They want to get comfortable knowing what you're using. Uh, there is a lot of good software companies out there. Um, tablets work good. I also have a palm that you can do them with. Uh, as you, you get older, you notice your eyesight's not as good as it was, so the palms don't work as good as they did when you first get into the business. But, uh, you know, find a system that you're comfortable with. We bring in a lot of tools. I like to use a real good water pressure gauge. We also have just one for checking tap water. This one works multi-purpose because I can check my flow for well. Uh, there is a screen in here, though. If you'll notice your pressures don't look right, you better look at your screen because it will plug up, especially with a high sediment well, and you're not going to flow what you think, so you do a two- or a three-hour flow test and you're only getting two gallons, you didn't pump much water. So pay attention, service your equipment fairly regular. You can have enough electrical meters. You need to get familiar, learn how to use them. Don't practice on a client's house. Take them downstairs to your house. Try and figure out what you're doing with them. Uh, we check every dryer and every range to see if they're wired correctly. A lot of times we'll find bad breakers where we have 120 going to a dryer, the other half of the breaker is bad. Things like that, the customer comes in and plugs in their new dryer and it doesn't work, you're going to be getting a phone call. Uh, anything you can check, yes, it is a visual non-destructive inspection. You don't have to do this. But if you can do it, it's a courtesy. Your clients like to see that. <coughs> in here, we have a lot of tools that cost some pretty good amount of money. You're not going to buy them right off the bat. You're going to buy what you can. Whenever we do aluminum wiring or older houses, this tool comes in very handy. We can load test the outlets. It's surprising how many houses of aluminum wiring that will have 85 volts, 90 volts. This is how we find it. You'll never, ever find it with one of these. Uh, so we use those quite a bit. Moisture meters. If you see a stain on the ceiling, is it dry or is it, uh, is it wet? Yeah, you put your fingers up there, you're not quite sure. Is that toilet leaking now or was it leaking before they fixed it? We don't know. Condos, you can't really go upstairs and chat, knock on the door and ask them if you can get into that unit. Well, with these, you can tell if it's an active leak or not. That way you can say it's a dry stain, keep an eye on it, or it's a wet stain. They're leaking right now. Somebody needs to fix this before we have a mold problem. So those tools, it's pretty hard to do without. Uh, you can try it for a while, but the sooner you can get them, the better. And they really don't cost that much if you shop around. <clears throat> when you do a home inspection... Pick a routine. It doesn't have to be my routine. Pick a routine and stick with it. It doesn't matter if the house is 8,000 square foot or 800 square foot. You need to use the same pattern, do the same walk through every house. That way, your client comes up, okay, can we go look at this, and you forget about this bathroom, or you don't check the outlets in a room, uh, and then there's a problem with that. You just missed it. I always ask my clients right off the bat, is there anything that you have a problem with? Do you want to know what it is that we need to talk about? And then I also tell them that if they have a question, I prefer they bring it up to me when they have that question. Because if they try to keep it and remember it, they're not going to remember to ask you at the end of the inspection. If you don't answer their questions, you're really not doing their job. Uh, you're going to get a phone call in the middle of the night, then you're going to have to try and deal with it at that time. So if you keep the same inspection every time, we do the main level work ourselves up, end up in the basement, then we do the mechanicals, crawl space attics. If you do the same inspection every time, you don't forget things, one, and if they ask you to come look at something, all you do is come back to the same place you were. You can leave your bag there, you can leave your flashlight there if you need a reminder of where you were, but in a big house that does help because, you know, when you're looking at a 7,000 square foot house, the rooms start to look the same. So, Anything you can do to remember, you just come back to that spot. Okay, where was I? Well, I've already done all this because I'm here. When I walk into one of my other inspector's inspections, I should be able to send him home at anywhere in the house. I know exactly where he's been, and we just double up. If he has a, a medical emergency with his kid, you know what? Your client still needs that inspection. So remember to get a routine. Stick with that routine on every house. Personally, I come in. I check the exterior lights, turn all my light switches on, ring the doorbell, and then I start clockwise rotation, work my way around the levels. That's what we're going to do here.
You do need to remember that when you're done, you need to turn your lights off. You don't want to leave all the lights on, so we have a checklist that we walk through at the end of the inspection to make sure we've turned off the ovens, make sure we turn off the fireplaces. Get yourself, to begin with, you'll write it all down. That's not a problem. Just make sure you do it. We open and close the doors. We check to make sure the weather strips are good. I talk to my client. We have a little common cracking right here. Nothing to be too concerned about, but they're going to ask that question down the road. If you've talked to them ahead of time, they know the answer. Okay, we have a solid self-closing door. We should have one. Feel the bottom, seal feels intact there, the threshold looks good. Our seals look good. Okay. Now, now is a good time to talk about safety, security. That garage door goes into the garage, or that doggy door goes into the garage. Anybody can get in here, take what's in the garage. If you don't have that door locked, they can come right into the house. Okay, you need to think about that a little bit. We have exposed wiring in the garage. When the age of this house was, we probably weren't required to have a chase here. Some municipalities require, some don't, like this one right here. You at least need to talk to your clients about safety. Let's not put rakes against her. Let's not put garden hose there. Uh, the best case scenario would be to put a piece of drywall there so it's protected. Protect any kind of exposed wiring. We don't want to have somebody cut it and get shocked. Here's a good place to look and see if we have nuts on our exposed bolts. A lot of times we'll find on an older house, particularly the 70s, we, we had our foundation anchors and nobody put nuts on them. So look at things like that. Let's make sure we have optic eyes, electronic sensors, and that they're actually wired. Look at the door. We looked at it from the outside already. Now is a good time to see if it sags. If we have any cracks that we couldn't see, that door will hang. Uh, look at this. We're missing a light. You can make an issue of that if you'd like or not. It looks like a newer garage door. Okay. One of the reasons we look up here very closely is because we're going to check reverse stops and we're going to check the optic eyes. If you have door damage here and you stop that door, you may damage that door even more. So then you need to talk to them ahead of time, say, hey, we've got a damaged panel here. I'm going to try and stop it, but I can't put too much tension on it because I don't want to break this door and have to buy a door. Look at things like that. If we have windows here, see if they're real glass. When I was first in the business, I stopped the door and the glass shattered all over me. Uh, plexiglass. We want to have some kind of safety glass there, especially if we have little kids around. Look at things like that. With the older springs, we'd have springs over here, the older garage doors. They can always put safety wires in if we don't have safety wires in them. Talk to them about things like that. You are the health safety advocate here. That is one of your jobs. Okay. The reason I check my reverse stops first is because if it doesn't work, I can just check my optic eyes and I'm good to go. This door did not stop and turn around. It is usually a small adjustment on the garage door to fix it. What I'll do is I'll try and adjust that, see if it works, because sometimes the garage door opener is defective. If you tell them it's an easy fix and then they have to buy a garage door to fix that, you don't look very good. So I'm going to grab my screwdriver right here. Close force. Okay, I want to lower that just a little bit. And this is a judgment call. Some people may not want to do it, and you may just want to write it up as, yeah, it's, it's wrong. That's fine. Uh, I personally would like to make the sellers a little safer, too. I consider this a safety issue. Now we have it working, but there's not much for adjustment there. So 
Are they going to ask the seller to replace the garage door opener? Probably not because now it's working, but my client's now informed so that if in the winter he has to crank it to make it come down, he's been told. He's not calling me asking him to buy him a garage door because we've already talked about this issue. Technically, it works right now. That was a pretty short window for an adjustment. But uh, your job is to educate them on what they're buying. <clears throat> now is a good time if you're going to check sprinkler systems to do it. You're in the garage. Here it is right here. <clears throat> sprinkler systems aren't part of a standards of practice. You need to tell your clients that. We talk to our clients and tell them that we'll check basic function as a courtesy. I can't see if there's leaks in the garage, yard. I don't want to pay for that sod there because we're missing some of the, uh, the yard. We're not getting good coverage. Uh, and those questions will come up. For years, I didn't think it would. I did have a client ask me to buy him a new sprinkler system because it missed part of the yard. Uh, people will ask you to do funny things. Her husband happened to be at the inspection and he knew all about it, but she was reading the report and didn't see it. So your job is just to educate them. If we can run it, as a courtesy, we're going to run it. All winter long, I can't run it. If the system's winterized, I'm not going to dewinterize it. It's a basic courtesy function. They're all different. You have to look at them. Okay. If there's directions, that makes it easy. If you have to mess with everything and you're not sure if you can get it back, you might be better off telling the client to request that it's operational at closing because you don't want to change their settings. This one here has the directions. Okay, we're going to go up this one here. I just have to change from A to manual. So we'll turn on zone one, see if it comes on. Now is a good time to explain coverage and why sprinkler systems aren't part of a standard of practice. You know, yes, this is a functioning sprinkler system. Is the coverage very good? Not whatsoever. Uh, they're still going to have to hand water. I haven't seen any other uh, spigots out in the center. But, uh, you know, it is a system. It's better than no system at all. Will they need to make adjustments, maybe change some heads, things like that? Yes. Uh, but we're going to run a basic function, see if the zones work, see if we're shooting water on the sidewalks. We just did the basic function test. We are trying to fire up here, but we have some leaks. We have water going on the concrete. Uh, the system isn't working to the best of its ability by any means. It needs to have some maintenance done. Uh, is it a big deal? Well, maybe to your client it is. But remember, just tell them straight out that it was a basic function test for courtesy. Um, the system's here. It needs repairs. Okay, then we can move on. It's not your job to tell them you have 16 heads that are bad, or you have this, or you have that. We're, we're looking at it as, uh, as a courtesy. We're looking at things like a firewall. Sometimes you can't see much of that wall. Uh, occupants' belongings all over. We can't see anything going on. You need to document that, talk to them about it, and note it. Here we have a pretty good view. Got to be very careful of when you're going to move something of a client. Like this mirror here would be very, very easy to break. Uh, if you can't see it and you can't safely do it without breaking somebody's possessions, you're not required to do it. You're not required to move things. If you can do it easily, yeah, it's a great idea. But you don't want to be buying things. Uh, one day I had a well tank was sitting in front of an electrical panel. The seller happened to be there. She says, oh, we just move it a little bit to look at that electrical panel. Well, I did that and bought an $800 well pressure tank. So could I really look at that without moving things? No. It should have been called out. I was already calling out that the well pressure tank should be moved. I didn't have to pay to have it moved personally, but that's what happened. So look at things like that uh, and use your own discretion on whether it's safe to move, whether you can move it, if it's grandma's old china hutch, I don't think I'd want to move it. So look at things like that. <clears throat> We're looking at the ceiling, firewall, uh, make sure it's intact. If there's small holes, they're easy to fix. If there's pieces of drywall missing, you know, we may have a shower above and we have water damage. It's a good time to look at these things. Uh, look at the floor. We should have a slope to the door. We don't want to slope back into the house. We're going to have foundation problems. 
This is where we had the water the flower garden over here. So let's look at it now. Okay, it looks good. So we haven't damaged it yet. This is a good time to uh, talk about preventative maintenance. Let's get rid of that before we have a problem with it. The tracks look in pretty good shape. The door looks in good shape. Uh, we've already talked about the opener, so we're all right there. So there's not a lot going on in this door, or in this garage. We're in pretty good shape. Now that we're back in the house, I'll usually just walk around, do a general, see what's going on, look at the ceiling for water stains, take pictures as I'm walking through the house. We really haven't started the inspection yet, but this is part of my memory process. Okay, there's a fireplace in the living. We're going to have a picture of that. We have ceiling fans. Okay, let's take a picture of that. Do we know if they work right now? No. Uh, we really don't care at this point. We're just kind of getting a general so that you uh, don't forget anything when you're writing your report. Did it, if you do two or three a day, did it have granite countertops? Did it have linoleum tile? What did it have? You know, I've taken pictures that show I have wooden carpeting. Okay, for flooring. Let's just take a, a quick little peek around. Anything you can do to remember them, your houses will start to run together. So if you write the reports at the end of the day like I do, you want to remember the house as best possible. You always want to check railings. If a house is older, it may have 8 inch uh, separations at the railings. Well, was it code when it was built? Yes, we're not code inspectors. We are looking for safety though. If you know they have little kids, those railings aren't safe for your, your little kids. Talk about some options. How can you take care of this or how can we do that? You want your clients to be safe. <clears throat> Just a general walk through, I see a lot of water stains up here. Probably due to plants. Uh, the roof looks good. Uh, we may have attic access up here. I hope we do. I doubt it's a problem with the roof, though. I think it's a problem with the plants. But we do have water damage there. How deep does it go? We really don't know. Uh, looks like it's probably surface, but if they start scraping that and find some slight mold growth, you want to at least talk to them ahead of time about it. We have a landing here and another step up. I would make a note to my clients, watch yourself so you don't trip on this. That way it's in the back of their head, you've already brought it up to them at one time. Uh, that way when they do trip on it some night, you've already informed them. Would I make a big deal about it? No, they're not going to change the whole house to fix it, but that way it's in the back of their head. Basically, all we're doing right now is just an initial, let's see what's up here. We don't even know what the house looks like. We haven't been in it before. Okay, here's the open windows we talked about earlier. Okay, we have a master bath. So at this point, I've seen a full bath uh, down the hall, and now we have a master bath here with a tub shower enclosure. Okay, pretty basic house. Now on the main level we have a three-quarter bath and another bedroom. Okay, now we can go downstairs. Let's just go down. I always like to take a picture of my main water shutoff valve when I first go downstairs. That way it's in my report. I always that's always the last picture of my report, so they don't shut off the sprinkler system and start working on their house. So we take a walk downstairs. We look, see if the railing's tight. All these things are just easier to walk through and look at to begin with. See a furnace filter down there. Hopefully that's a good sign that they've been replacing their furnace filters. Okay, here's the main water shutoff. When I bring the client down here, I'd explain we have two water pressure regulators. That means we're regulating the sprinkler side also. Uh, limits how many heads you can have on a zone, things like that. I also explain to them that Adjusting that screw to give yourself more water pressure doesn't give you more volume. Besides the fact it's being illegal, uh, it doesn't really give them much benefit. So usually when you talk to them, they'll quit doing it. Okay, this is their main water shutoff. This will be for a sprinkler system. That wa that's why I always have the picture in my report and it says main water shutoff valve. That way they don't shut this off and think they can work on their toilets. Now the age of the house, I was expecting to see a grounding system here. It was fairly common to have one in the kitchen on this age also here. Uh, we'd prefer it here, now it's a requirement that it be at the main water. 
but uh, in some of the older houses, its kitchen was awful common. So we'll look around, just see if we note that stuff right off the bat. Okay, we have steel columns, we have an I-beam here. Okay, looking around, this is a floating slab. Okay, now we have to talk about, if you ever finish this, we're going to want to float our walls. Uh, explain what a floating wall is to the client, because if they hire a contractor, he comes in here and doesn't float it, and then the concrete moves, we're going to cause damage up above. Uh, just things like that. We're going to take a picture of the laundry facilities. Yeah, they're scattered around a little bit. Uh, we're going to come down and inspect them later, but it just gives us a good idea what's here. Okay. We have a sump pit that's been glued over, so we really can't look inside it. So we don't know if it's active or if it should be active. So I'm going to bring that to my client. You know, I'd want to look inside there, see what we have for water. Uh, see if we have too much water. If we don't have any, we're in great shape. Uh, coming over here, I see we're missing uh, junction box covers on this light fixture. Uh, somebody's added a 12, the uh, yellow wires. We know it's 12 gauge. Okay, we're coming right here. There's a panel downstairs. Uh, looks like a 100 amp main here. We have a couple of metal lines coming out. So now I can follow. Okay. Here's our ground. Coming along here. Okay, here's where our electrical ground is right here. And it's loose. So just things like that. All my pictures have a meaning. If I'm holding a clamp, the clamp is loose. If you take a picture of your feet on a roof, it's spongy or a squeak. Get all your photos to have a reason. Yes, you're taking a bunch of photos just to take, but something should clue you in that there's a problem because in two years when somebody calls you, and they call you on under the carpet, say, hey, you know, we have this problem. It's like, oh, yeah, but that was there. Here's the picture to prove it. We talked about that. I didn't cause it. Just things like that. 89 on the date here. Uh, we have a 2003 water heater. I take a picture of the data tags of all these so I know how many gallons it is. Uh, when I take this apart, I'll take so I can put the model number, serial number in the uh, report. Uh, but right now we're not doing the inspection. We're just doing a quick walk around. Uh, we're going to have a crawl space. We're going to have to take it apart so we can go in there. So this has a basement and a crawl space. Just things like that are your quick walk around. Uh, you can see here we have a great view of the basement. Okay, do we have water stains? Do we have things like that? Uh, that way when you're looking up there, see if the kitchen's still leaking because we have that damaged subfloor. We have outside combustion air. So we're just doing a quick check. Now we'll go up and we'll get started. Okay, as we're coming in the house, I like to check all the outlets. Depending on the age of the house, I may use this tester. If we have some ungrounded wiring, I'm going to use a sure test or a different meter so I can check for bootleg, false grounds, things like that. Aluminum wiring, like I say, we load test every outlet we get at. I'll also pull a couple switch plates to see if those outlets are rated for aluminum wiring. Uh, I live in a house with aluminum wire. They are 66 more times likely to burn down. Your job is to educate the client. It's not to tell them, I'd never live in a house with aluminum wire. It's to tell them there's some things need to be done. We need to call an electrician to make sure we have antioxidant. We have to take care of things like that. Uh, make it as safe as it can be. Uh, so that's one of your jobs. Walking around here, okay, we're going to check the windows. I've checked these outlets. They're all wired correctly. Our lighting works. We're kind of minimal on lighting here, but it all works. Does the windows open? You know, what kind of windows do we have? Most operating softwares want to know, do we have a casement? Do we have a vinyl sliding? Do we have a double hung? What, what, what's the window situation? We want to look for fogging. We already know we have some of that going on. We saw one from the outside. Okay, we have over here, we have shades. Well. It's not your job to tell them if a shade is in good shape or not. Some clients would like you to, uh, and that's all right if you want to. More than anything, we're looking at the window. If we don't move those shades up, we can't tell what the window's going to do. That's one of the reasons I wore my gloves outside, because we give a light color shade or a blind, and I leave hand prints, paw prints on it, nobody's going to be very happy with me. If you do a house that has no running water, 
and you don't have your alcohol out in the car, you really can't clean your hands at all to, to check it. So think about those things ahead of time. Now my company, we check every window. Uh, if I can't get at it, if there's something in the way, then I can't check it. But uh, it's awful hard for me to know if this is sealed, if it's fogged, if I only check 10% of the windows or 30% of the windows. We're doing a home inspection here. If you're doing commercial inspections, a lot of times you'll be doing a representative number of rooms. Then, of course, you can't check every window in the building. But uh, on a home, you may have 30 windows. That's, that's a pretty big home. It's not that big a deal to check 30 windows. Uh, you know, go above and beyond. Try, try and do the best job you can. That's what's going to get you your referrals down the road. Uh, being a hard inspector isn't going to get you the referrals. Being a knowledgeable inspector is going to get you the referrals. It's a little dining area. This light's pretty good here. Uh, pay attention when you walk in the dining room, especially if there's not a table that you don't clunk your head. You don't look real professional when you go ahead and bang yourself and knock yourself out. Uh, we've all done it. You will continue to do it, but just kind of look around the room before you walk in. If you want to come here and look at this, it's a little bit different fan switch. You're going to run into things that you don't you're not familiar with all the time. Our business is constantly changing. Light fixtures change, appliances change. I usually make a joke about it. It's like, oh, I haven't dealt with one of these. Let's see if I can figure out, see if I'm smarter than the light. Uh, you kind of try to put your clients at ease. Uh, you're not required to know everything. You should be able to figure out most things, but if you don't know, tell them, I don't know, I've never seen this. Let me do some research on that. There's no problem with that. The internet has a lot of information. NASHI has a ton of information on their sites. Throw it on the message board. Hey, I came across this. Has anybody seen it? Uh, you know, you have a lot of fellow inspectors out there that are willing to help out. Some of the real good guys about that. The fans got a little bit of a wobble. I'd tell my client, you know, there's uh, kits. Looks like a little horseshoe weight that you can balance that fan. Uh, that way it doesn't bother you. Uh, doesn't crack the ceiling up above. Uh, I don't make a big deal out of it, but I would tell him to balance this fan. When we come into a house, we have inside shoes, outside shoes. We also use booties like this. Uh, you can use the disposable boot booties. We make a big deal of putting them on. I tell all my clients, you know, all my inspectors have to wear it. If I walk in the house and they don't have them on, I'll send them home. Uh, we're trying to leave this house as clean. Sometimes you're wearing them to keep your feet clean, <laughs> but uh, that, that's the worst case scenario. <clears throat> but uh, little things like that go a long ways. Uh, these are like 15 bucks and you get about a year out of them. Uh, so it's not a, not a big expense to do, but people like it. You know, you're coming into their potential for, you know, future home. We want to keep it clean. Things like that really make an impression on somebody. Okay, we're in the bathroom. First thing I like to do is take kind of a general look around. <clears throat> Run the water, make sure hot's hot, cold's cold. See if we have a stopper. It works. Okay. Then I come over here and I'm going to look at the shower. After you turn the water on, it's not the time to look at your shower. Just like checking windows in your bathtub. Okay. We have a little bit of cracking here around the shower fixture. Not a bunch, but a little bit. So I'll take a picture of that and my reports will say this one here is very clean. The grout just needs to be touched up and sealed. Uh, whenever we spray water on it, if the grout changes color, it's due for a sealing. So we're going to turn this on. Try not to get yourself soaked. The grout looks pretty good in this. Uh, I usually try to explain when we have carpeting that whenever they remove this carpeting, they will see water stains on that floor. People will get shocked and think they have a real big problem, especially if the carpet's in bad shape or the, the, they're getting it done right then. Explain that that's normal so you don't get that frantic phone call in the middle of the night. When I'm running my shower and I'm running my faucet, what I will do after I make sure hot is hot and cold is cold, then I wiggle the toilet. See, this toilet looks loose. You don't need to rip them out of the floor. 
you should be able to find it like this. And then to check working water pressure, we've already checked our water pressure. It's regulated in this area to 55 pounds. Flush the toilet. We have some drop, not drastic, but uh, we do have a drop. So then I tell my clients, okay, if you're having a shower and somebody does that, you'll notice it, but you're not going to get scalded. You're not going to have a drop in water pressure. Uh, but bring it to their attention ahead of time so they don't think it's a problem. GFCI outlets should always be tested, always be recommended. Uh, on an older house, it's an upgrade. I tell my clients, this is an upgrade. It's not your job to tell them what to ask for. That's their real estate professional's job. Your job is to tell them what needs to be done to the house, the good, the bad about the house, and some safety things that they can do to help keep their family safe, maintain the house. This particular one has a GFCI a central, a common GFCI. So we trip it here. Do I know which bathroom it is yet? No. Uh, we're going to come up to it. We're going to find it. We're going to test it. And then I'll tell my clients, okay, they're all protected under one. When you trip or when your daughter trips with a hair dryer, she'll have to come to the master or the main bathroom where it is so that they're not looking for it, can't figure out why their bathroom outlets don't work, and it's just a GFCI tripped in one of the bathrooms. So I try to locate all those and tell them where they are. Now this house <clears throat> didn't used to be all carpet. The doors rubbed pretty hard. Eventually they're going to damage that carpet down there. So I'll talk to my clients, say, you know, this door, you could shave the bottom of the door, undercutting. Uh, that's also going to help heat because we have a fairly minimal return air system. <clears throat> we don't have any crossover ducts here. So if this door is closed, we're not really going to have airflow into this room from the furnace so, or from the air conditioner if this house had air conditioning. So if you undercut the doors, that will help a lot. So uh, this one here, you'd probably cut a half inch off that door. Usually there's enough space that you can do that. It's just suggestions you can make to make the house a lot more comfortable to live in. In this closet, we find another laundry facility. No washer and dryer in there, but it's there. So, <clears throat> we have a dryer duct. We're hot and cold. Right, we have a laundry chute. Okay, we're going to check, make sure we're wired correctly. Myself, I'm going to go get my electrical tester. I'm going to test this outlet. <clears throat> then I'm going to talk about the fact that this is an older home, so we have a three-pronged dryer outlet. Because when you buy a dryer, they don't come with an electrical cord. 96 and newer is a four prong. This house we use to ground. The newer houses we use ground and neutrals. So that way they don't go to the, dry, to the appliance store, buy a dryer and come back with the wrong cord and they can't use it. Anything you can tell them, just educate them. That is your job here. We're educating the client. Okay, I just checked this. We have two hots and a ground. Even though it was taped over, that was just more of a safety issue for them. Sometimes you'll see tape over it and somebody's disabled this outlet. Well, your client would like to know if that outlet's good or bad before he plugs in a dryer and finds out that it was disabled because now they used the one in the basement and it doesn't work that way. <clears throat> the other thing we kind of want to look at, when we're looking at the electrical panel, see if there's two dryer breakers. Because we have a dryer downstairs, we don't want a junction box off two dryer outlets. That's not allowed. So we need to see how they wired this. So just keep it in the back of your head. It's like, okay, two laundry facilities, we should have two dryer breakers. When possible, I like to open the shades just so I get a better view of the house. Uh, these here, they don't really hold up very well. You can do it. Uh, myself, I'd probably just try and find one that would give me some light on the subject. Uh, I also use a lot of flashlights because certain water stains and that might show up better under fluorescent than it will regular. Uh, get in the habit of looking at things from different angles, walking around, checking, okay, well now we know there's a bathroom here, look at the ceiling below it. We know we had a loose toilet there, so if that was on a main, uh, upper level, look for water stains. Uh, talk to them about it. You know, these windows here are pulling a lot of sun. They look in pretty good shape. Uh, over here, we can see the patio door, we have fog glass. 
you could get that smoky, hazy look. If you go try to clean it, it doesn't clean. Well, you want your clients to know that. There's a couple rules on a gas fireplace. <clears throat> Some of it's code rules, which we're not code inspectors, but we're safety inspectors. Uh, we have to have a shutoff at the front of the fireplace. Okay, here we have a key for gas fireplace. Fireplaces, you should really take a fireplace course if you hadn't taken one. There's some rules. Number one, they should come on within two seconds. Uh, it shouldn't be a minute after you turn the switch and it comes on. Two, we should never have any soot on a gas fireplace. First thing you look at when you have soot, if it's a, a direct vent, is see if you have a bird's nest in there. Happens a lot. Uh, we could also be a jetting problem. Usually soot's a venting problem. Three, if we have a solid glass, we shouldn't have any black smoky buildup on it. Uh, if you tell your clients those three rules, two years from now they start to get the soot there, well that can backdraft the CO into the house. That bird's nest isn't letting uh, the, the fireplace vent correctly. Or the air is plugged, we have an air, fresh air intake there, that's plugged, so we're not burning correctly. It'll be indications to them that we have a problem. We need to get somebody out here to fix this because I don't want to kill my family. Um, in Colorado, <clears throat> the only people that are allowed to light a pilot light are either the homeowner, a licensed plumber or HVAC technician, or an employee of the gas company. We can't light a pilot light. So when we do our information ahead of time, we send our clients emails, we send the agent emails requesting that all the pilot lights be lit. Uh, that way, I, nobody's asking me to light them. They already know it's our company policy that I'm not going to break the law. So we don't want that issue doesn't come up. If we get there and the water heater's not on or the fireplace isn't lit, I'll do a visual, but I can't run this. And uh, they understand because it's already been in front of them. Now this one, the pilot light was lit, so we can turn it on. Okay, it comes on. The flame doesn't look too bad. This soot could be because we have the doors closed and we don't have adequate combustion air. That goes back to the, the uh, fresh air intake there. See how the fire's rolling out right now? It's trying to pull air out of here. Okay, well we're not getting enough air into this. This fireplace has some issues. We want to get this fireplace looked at so that we're not spewing carbon monoxide out here. Uh, we can come with a gas meter, we can check that. Uh, we already know there's a problem. Do I really need to check this one? No, I'm going to require, recommend that they have a licensed uh, contractor come out, licensed technician come out and set this up and fix it. I can also see the shield on the gas fill has been pretty warm. Okay, well, it's probably not the best place to have it. Is it safe? Is the log size, uh, the burner size for the logs? Well, that's what a fireplace technician is going to do. It's already failing a couple of my tests. So I already know it needs some, uh, some further evaluation, and that's part of our job here. You don't have to fix anything. You just have to know when it's broken. This is a converted fireplace. So we need to look up. They've taken the damper out, which is acceptable. Uh, they do make, make a block to, a, uh, to open the damper part way. A gas fireplace cannot have a movable damper. It cannot be able to be closed. Uh, otherwise, what happens is all that venting will come out in the house. So you need to look at things like that. Talk to your client about it. Removing the damper isn't really the best option because now we have that cold air comes in. If these doors don't seal all the way, the better option would have been to put a, a fixed damper that was only open partway. But that's what they did. So I talked to my clients about that. Tell them that you know what, you're going to notice some cool air here on the, the cold days in the winter. There's not much you can do because it took the damper out. Just tell them things like that. And now, we were only probably 25-30% done on this inspection, but you may think I'm pointing out a lot of problems to my clients. How you discuss it is almost as important as what you say. Because I can pick any house apart and talk a client out of buying a very nice house. All these problems we've talked about can be fixed for a fairly minimal amount of money. Who pays to fix it? I don't care. It's not my problem. What we're trying to do here is educate them to exactly what they're buying. And they know there's maintenance to be taken care of. They know things need to be done. But I'm not going to sit here and tell the client that they should run away, they should do this, they should do that. That's not what we're here for. 
I'm just trying to tell them that this is all the things that need to be done. These will be in the report. The report's like a reminder, but now they know what's the actual condition of the house they're buying. Okay, when you come into the kitchen, depending on the age of the kitchen, maybe GFCIs, maybe one GFCI can be within six foot of the sink. Older houses, they didn't have any. So you need to talk to them a little bit about, okay, what's safe? Okay, definitely anything within six foot of a water source. We want to recommend it, if nothing else, is an upgrade. Uh, if I was selling an older house, I wouldn't expect to have to put in GFCIs because it didn't come with it. Talk to your client about things like that because it'll make it easier when the seller says, no, I'm not going to put those in. You're buying a 1950 house. Well, that way <clears throat> you kind of head it off before it becomes a problem. <clears throat> Looking at cabinets, hanging kitchen cabinets. <clears throat> These have the proper screws. A lot of times you'll find deck screws or drywall screws in the upper cabinets. They don't have any shear strength. They load them too heavy, they're going to fall and they're going to break. If they hit, hit somebody, they're going to hurt somebody. Look at those screws. I have a, a note that I have a drop down. Proper screws should be put it, installed at all hanging kitchen cabinets if they're the wrong screws. Some municipalities are still allowing deck screws to be used to hang cabinets. Uh, you have to check where you are doesn't mean I'm calling on a code problem. I'm telling them for safety. Let's, let's do this. Take care of it. <clears throat> we have a dishwasher here. Lots of ways to plumb a dishwasher. A couple of them right. Depending on the age of the appliance, we can use a high loop. We can go directly to the garbage disposal. We can have an air gap. Depends on the age of this. The newer ones have an air gap built into it. So I always look. I take a picture underneath the sink. I take a picture of my garbage disposal wire in case it's missing the clamp, and I take a picture of either my high loop or my direct, which has an air gap built into it. If this was an older one, then I would call this out as a defect because there's no air gap device here. A garbage disposal is not an air gap device. But this is new enough, I'm confident that it's built into this. We're missing the clamp for the wire. So, <clears throat> I'm going to put a note in the garbage disposal wire clamp is missing. If this gets pushed and it cuts on there, now we're mixing electricity and water. It's not a good combination. Uh, we see that quite often. Look in here for general stainage. The reason I take my first picture is if I can't see any here because they have so much stuff in here, it's awful hard for me to comment on this. So if they find out there's some moisture damage, well, it was restricted view. I couldn't see everything. So it doesn't look too bad. We're going to run, check, make sure hot's hot, cold's cold, check both sinks, make sure we're not leaking, look for general chipping, things like that. Uh, check the spray one. A lot of times you'll find that in an older house, as soon as you hit the spray one, our faucet shuts down and doesn't come back on. If it's an older faucet, I'll tell my clients that up front. You know, sometimes this will damage, and uh, just to cover it up, because I don't want to buy the faucet when it fails. Uh, this seems to be working all right. We're hot. So now I'll put the cold over here. Make sure nothing's in that disposal because you don't want to damage grandma's fine china or fine uh, silverware because you turn on the garbage disposal when there's a spoon in there. So, okay, it sounds good. We're working. We're cold. We're cold. This looks real good. Biggest thing here is a clamp for the garbage disposal. So not a lot going on. Take a look at your cabinets, check your doors, things like that. Okay, we have our microwave here. Let's make sure it's wired correctly. There's been a lot of recalls on microwaves. You're not required to know all the recalls, but it's not a bad idea if you apply. There is a couple of uh, companies that you can pay to be on a recall list they'll send you all the appliance recalls, things like that. I personally subscribe. I think it's a good idea. Uh, <clears throat> I don't tell my clients I'm going to do that, but if I see one that I remember there's a problem on it, or I'll take a picture, and then I'll put it in the report. I take pictures of serial numbers, things like that. We're looking at this oven. Okay, we're going to test this in a minute. Uh, we're going to look. Let's see if we can see a gas shutoff valve behind it. Uh, things like that. We know we're gas. Are we gas and electric? This one's straight gas. Usually your reports ask that. I look back here to see a picture, see if we have a gas valve. We do. I take a picture of it just so I know in my mind that there's a gas shutoff valve there. 
Okay, when we're looking at this microwave, this is a little microwave tester you can get at the Nashi store. Uh, we give them away a lot. Uh, you don't want to run them for more than eight seconds. You'd be amazed how many microwaves you'll find that look, sound good, and they do nothing. Uh, you can just run it quick. They should flash. Okay, this one works. The other thing these are good for is then I have a bean bag, and I'll set that in there for a little longer. This will light if we have leaks at the door. These are really only a couple of bucks, but clients are very impressed when you're checking their microwave, checking things like that, and you have about 10 bucks involved in your tools. So not a big deal. Okay, we have a fan, we have a surface light. Okay, we're in pretty good shape here. Gas, okay, let's see what we have. Look inside, make sure you don't have anything in there. Uh, you don't want to melt. It's amazing what people store in their ovens. So uh, take a peek at it. Just like I looked in the dishwasher before I ran it. You want to make sure that nothing's in there that's going to get damaged. On a new house, you want to make sure the plastic wrap's removed. You don't want to melt that inside there. So what we do, okay, light your burners. Okay, and we look good. These are removable to clean. So if they don't look good, I let them cool off, then I'll talk to the client. You know, usually these can just be cleaned. Uh, you don't want to leave an electric. A good way to check your, your breakers and all that is running your oven. You don't want to leave a stove top on with nothing on it on electric, especially your back ones. You'll find out you melt your knobs back here. So you might turn the front ones and turn the oven on, try to lower the Zinsco electrical panel, things like that to get them to fail. Don't leave the back ones on because you're going to be buying yourself an oven. So I always take the client's pots and pans off here just so nothing gets melted, nothing gets damaged. I also warn my clients that, hey, this is going to be hot, especially an electric cooktop is going to stay hot. Uh, so we, we make sure they know that. I turn on the ovens. I let them get to operating temperatures. <clears throat> Do a quick check on them. One of my checklist items for when we're leaving the property is that the oven is off. You don't want to leave that oven on. People don't like that. Uh, so if you make yourself a checklist that all the things you run through when you're done, smoke detectors, shutting off this, shutting off that, your oven should be one of those, just like your fireplace. We're looking pretty good in here. We'll let that oven get hot, and we'll come back to it a little later. As a courtesy, I look at the refrigerator pretty quickly. But I tell the client that it's not part of a standard of practice. A, a refrigerator can go out any day. Uh, really not safety items like there is an oven. So we do a brief look at it, but I'm not including it. There's not even going to be mention of it in the report, and I'll let my clients know that. It, if, it, if you come in here and it doesn't work, that's too bad, but it was working today. And that's all we check for a refrigerator. When you're going up the stairs, just check for your railing. Good rule of thumb, it's four inches. If you're fist like this, I've measured mine. I know what four inches is. If it'll fit through, that's a safety issue. It's a code issue on newer homes, but more than anything, we're looking at safety. Check your eyes and your run. Look at it from the bottom. You can get a tape measure out if you want. Uh, usually, I use the tape to confirm that it's off. Uh, you want an even a rise and a run so that uh, we don't have trip hazards. Coming up here, this is a landing, so we're allowed to have that, although it does kind of make a trip, a trip hazard if you're not watching what you're doing. So I'd at least make a note of that to my clients. Just say, hey, remember this, and that way they're aware of it. Here's that laundry chute. The last thing I do after my clients walk out of the house is I pop off all my smoke detectors. They don't need to hear that. I don't like to make their ears listen to what I have to listen to. So I walk around with a long probe and I pop off every smoke detector. Still recommend that every smoke detector battery get replaced annually. Uh, smoke detectors are typically good for 10 years. Carbon monoxide detectors are good for five. So if they look older than that, we recommend replacement.
Okay, this, this is a steel sink. We're pretty typical, we see a lot of them. The problem with a steel sink is the overflow rusts out. Kids, if they have kids in the house, a lot of time in the main bathroom, not so much in the master, but you'll see it there, they like to watch the overflow when they're brushing their teeth. Uh, so if you look here, we have a chip. That's kind of an indication somebody's dropped something. But if you look up underneath, you're going to see that the sink is rusted out. And the overflow is rusted so that eventually the sink is going to have to be replaced because it's going to leak. Uh, right now it will only leak in the overflow mode, but you give it another year, that sink's going to be leaking all the time. Okay, as we were saying, down the basement, bathroom should be GFCI protected. New rules has to be one in each uh, bathroom. That's just coming into play now in 2008. Most houses we're going to find there's one GFCI that protects the whole house. On this house, it happens to be in the master. It could be in any of the bathrooms, whichever is first on the leg. I like to tell my clients where it is so that if they trip it with their hair dryer or their blower, they know where to go to reset re it. Or if they plug in and their outlet's dead, maybe their kids tripped it. So that way we're not looking around, you're not getting a call that my bathroom outlets don't work. Both sinks here are also rusted out, just starting to leak. Uh, we also have a loose toilet here. This is loose enough that there's a good chance you'd see stainage down below. I didn't see any, but we don't know the last time it was painted. So we definitely want to be recommending new wax seals, having the toilets tightened. Uh, if you caulk around the toilet, you never caulk around the back, so that if this wax seal does leak, you see a stain. The grout here is starting to come apart a little bit. That's an indication they probably didn't put a, uh, any tile backer or any kind of concrete down there. Uh, it isn't going to get any better. It's going to be an ongoing concern. Uh, the tile's not broken. Pretty solid uh, plywood, but I at least make mention to them that uh, the grout's coming up and they're just going to have to keep touching it up. Okay, whenever you come to a panel, first thing you should do is never grab it. Brush your hand like this. If it is live, your muscles are going to contract this way. If you go like this and it's hot, you're stuck. So you never want to touch a panel dead on. Never come up and grab the door like you're going to open it up. Always do this. <clears throat> I come in, first thing I do right now is I take a picture. That way I have a, a memory what was on and what was off. That way if somebody says, well, you turned off the freezer, uh, well, no, it was off when I got here. So we have that picture. <coughs> okay, looking at these, <coughs> we noticed we had two dryers here already. Well, the correct way to wire two dryers is to have two breakers. Well, we're looking here, we only have one dryer breaker found some junction boxes up here where they've tied into our dryer circuit to make two. That's not acceptable. We can't do that. So there's going to be a note that the dryers need to be hardwired correctly for safety. We're pulling off one breaker, running two appliances. It doesn't work that way. <clears throat> when you take off the screws, we have a hot tub breaker shut off. There's no longer a hot tub here, but it looks like at one time they had a provision for one. When you take out your screws, any screw that's put in a panel should be flat tipped. Shouldn't be a point on it. That way if you do actually hit a wire, it's going to move the wire instead of putting a hole in it. So you need to look at these screws when you take them out. What I do if they're the wrong screws, I just take a picture of the screws in my hand and that's my indication that we need to put proper screws in here. This is a 100 amp service, which is fairly minimal for a house this size. Uh, with two dryers and a hot tub, you are really pushing it. Uh, they don't have air conditioning, so we're okay, but I'd advise my client that, you know, if you're going to run air conditioning, you have to take out the hot tub one, put air conditioning in. You'd be pretty minimal if you were trying to put air conditioning and a hot tub at this house. You'd be pushing the, uh, pushing the current load. <clears throat> okay, when we get inside a panel, <clears throat> we want to look and see what our service wires are. Here we're using aluminum. Size of them. Looks like they're sized for 100 amp service. So if we wanted to go any more, we'd have to bring in new service lines to here. Doesn't mean the outside meter won't take more, but this won't. Okay, then we're gonna look. Okay, look at our grounding system. Look at our neutral wires. Well, the age of this house, we used to be able to uh, double tap or connect two neutral wires to one lug. We're no longer allowed to do that. The age of this house, it was acceptable. You'll, you'll get high resistance issues with that. I always make a note of that, that yes, even though it's an older house, we do have two neutral wires attached to one lug. Uh, tell my clients, yeah, we still allow, but it's something that needs to be looked at. Uh, if they ever have an electrician out here at that time, I'd ask them to take care of that. 
Other thing we're going to look at, <clears throat> we're going to compare our wire size to our breakers. 15 amp uh, breakers, 14 gauge wiring. Uh, 12 gauge wires can go up to 20. Uh, make sure that we're wire size correlated. Uh, make sure we have the proper size breakers, 30 for a dryer. Uh, we had gas for the uh, range, so we don't use that. So that kind of helps us on the 100 amp service. Everything in here is hot. So you definitely don't want to take your screwdriver. If you noticed, as soon as I take those screws off, I put the screwdriver in my pocket and I take out a pen. The reason I do that is because you get showing somebody something and natural reflex, you touch something. <clears throat> I use a plastic pen. It works real good as a pointer. And I'll point out to my clients, okay, we have 15 gauge here. That's a, four, or a 15 amp breaker. That's 14 gauge wire. Uh, this is 20, so we can go up to uh, 12. When we walk around like that, you're not tempted to hit something. This is the main panel, so our neutral center grounds can be connected. Uh, if this was a sub panel, which you usually see in a basement, we'd expect a grounding bus bar, and we'd have those separated. Uh, we're looking at grounding source here. I already saw one was a driven rod outside, uh, right over in this corner here. The other one we followed earlier to the grounding uh, clamp above the water heater. Not an ideal location for it, but it was okay when this house was built. Uh, if any electrical work's done, it will be moved over to the, the cold water uh, shutoff, and they should bond over the hot water heater. Uh, wasn't required when they did this. Doesn't mean it's not a good safety upgrade. <clears throat> so everything in here looks pretty good. Uh, we do have wire bushings, uh, clamps, so we're all right with that. And now, as I mentioned, I took a picture when we took it apart for the breakers. Now I take a picture when I got it back together. Uh, your pictures are all stamped, so if it ever came down to it, you could show that you were back, you had taken it apart, you had pictures of it apart, then you have pictures of it together. That way, just the one breaker's off, everything else is on. That way you're not in trouble by turning off the freezer or whatever. So uh, that's how I kind of cover myself on that. Coming to the basement now, <clears throat> I'm looking, these are good sized windows, but we have no ladders. So uh, we should have at least one egress ladder here. One of these windows has to be your means out. They are sufficient size. They are below 44 inches, so we'd be all right on that for uh, egress windows. We have a pretty good amount of exposed concrete, so between the lack of cracking outside, the lack of movement here, we have a pretty good indication the foundation's in good shape. Uh, looks like we have ABS plumbing. Age of this property is the late 80s. Uh, we've had some issues with ABS at that point. Uh, I usually look and see what brand it is, take a picture of the brand, uh, because there's only three or four manufacturers that had problems with their ABS resin. So uh, something you need to be aware of, can you look at every fitting? No. If they don't look like they're leaking, that's fine, but you want to be aware of that for yourself. Okay, look at the water heater. Look, we have a barometric damper up here. Uh, we also have a lot of debris that's coming out, out of this, this flue here. Typically, we don't start out, go bigger, and then down small up until we get here, uh, I'm having some suspicions we may have a venting problem with this, uh, especially when we're seeing all this uh, buildup here. Uh, when I get back to the office, I'm going to do a little more research on this. You can't be expected to know everything. Uh, doesn't mean you can't find out. I talk to my clients and say, you know, this doesn't really appear to be venting properly. I want to look and see if it's approved method. I may or may not be able to find anything on it, but I, I still think it, it bears further consideration. I think I'd be having somebody look at that because of this right here. I think you have enough indications of a, a backdraft that this thing's spilling out. We're going to fire off the water heater, too, and I'm going to see if I can pick up anything with my uh, gas readings. Uh, we may or may not, but for safety, I think you just have to call it out. Looking at we have a TPR valve. We have an overflow pipe coming down the ground. We have a drain right here. So we're all right with that. Cool. 
We just fired up, so we'll be able to check that back drafting. This combustible gas or uh, CO meter, this is combustible gas leak detector. You should have both. Uh, I like this particular brand. I also have a Bacharet out in the truck. They do a great job. They do need to be uh, calibrated every six months. Uh, several companies will do that. We have a local company here that takes care of it, so it's pretty easy to drop it off, pick it up the next day. That's why I have two. Uh, actually have a couple of them. I have another one like this, but it's pretty easy to have one out of the field when you have multiples. Uh, water heaters, 40 gallon. On the minimal side for this house, depending on how many people are going to live here, uh, that's a pretty big bathtub in the master. I would warn my clients that they may have a hard time filling that unless that's all they're doing. Now, I'm not picking up anything right now with a burner on. That doesn't mean we won't, though, when a furnace fires up. We're going to pull a whole lot more air out of this. We do have outside combustion air here, but it's not hard to imagine this furnace pulling out of this fan here. When we have all the buildup right over here, I believe that's probably how it's coming through because everything's getting drawn this direction. Uh, that tells us, though, it's summer. It's not an immediate safety health concern. So I really don't have to call the sellers and say, hey, we have a, a health issue right here. Uh, if this was in the winter, I'd probably leave a note that we have, have an issue with the, the venting and we should have that looked at before uh, somebody has a problem. Uh, carbon monoxide detectors are always a, a recommendation. This here would make it even more so. Uh, looking at the furnace, 80% efficient. We have a metal flue. Electronic ignition for the pilot light. Uh, Looks reasonably clean. We're going to look at it over real carefully. We're going to check carbon monoxide output. Uh, just take a look and see what we have going here. But just general impression, it looks pretty good. I take pictures of the serial number, model number, uh, full data tag of this furnace. That way it's in my files. I also include it on their hard copy report so that any time they call to have it serviced, which you should be recommending every year, as per the manufacturer, then they don't have to come down and look it up. They have it all in their files. It just makes it easy for them, a little more likely to happen. We check our fittings for gas leaks. I haven't smelt any. Want to check our gas valve very carefully. And our flex lines, because we have a tendency to have some problems with those, especially if somebody reuses one. <clears throat> Anytime this furnace is replaced now, we'd have a flex line from here on out. When this house was built, it wasn't a requirement. We'd also have flex lines at the water heater, which tells me somebody probably didn't pull a permit to do this water heater, because the date on it is an 8-2003, and we we're requiring flex lines by then. The reason is we're on a concrete floor that can move. If this floor should settle, I've seen furnaces hanging by the uh, gas lines. Uh, so that's something that I just bring up, talk to my clients, say, if somebody's out here, if you ever have anything done, I'd have this done at that time. Uh, a lot of water heaters are put in without permits. Doesn't make it right, uh, but it's more of a four-year information. We're still looking at it. Still seems like it's safe. I would have liked to see flex lines here, though. We go upstairs, turn the furnace on. We'll fire it up, see what we have uh, we shouldn't have any carbon monoxide at the registers. We will have at the vent pipe. Now this filter here, if you're looking the way it's installed, isn't doing much. Uh, the filter is supposed to be this way, so it actually filters air. It comes in the side, comes down, in. 
The way it was right there, it went right along that filter. It'd last a long time when it's not filtering any air. Because of that, I didn't see any pets here, and this looks pretty clean. But uh, I'd ask my clients, especially if I saw a lot of dirt, because now we've been cycling everything through the house. Ask them if they have kids have allergies, anything like that, because it may be in yours and their best interest to have the ducts clean because that, we don't know how long that filter's been that way. Now when we turn on our furnace, I explain the operation to my clients. We've got a draft fan, inducer blower, vent fan, several names for this. It has two purposes. First is mechanical ventilation. We no longer rely on thermal dynamics to get out our uh, dirty gases. We're going to start seeing them on the water heaters now too. It's going to become a requirement. This will come on 15 to 30 seconds before the furnace runs, all determined by the timer board. On this one, we have electronic ignition. We lit our pilot light. Uh, after we get hot, we'll turn on our blower motor. If we have the draft fan comes on, we hear the spark and nothing lights, we may have a gas problem or we may need to adjust that spark gap. Every furnace manufacturer recommends their furnace to be cleaned and serviced annually. It's a good time to talk about that and why. We lit up pretty nice. Our flame colors look good. On a natural gas system, we should never have a yellow flame. Blue and orange are fine, uh, but never yellow. On a propane system, you will see some yellow tinting. Uh, if we have yellow, that's an improperly adjusted uh, furnace, will produce a lot of soot. So we're going to look at this, <clears throat> let it get hot. We're going to check carbon monoxide I'll put at the registers. We shouldn't have any. After that, I'm going to check at the vent. Now, this isn't part of a requirement or standards of practice. It's something I like to do. Uh, I would recommend you do it, but there's no, no governing body anywhere that says you have to do it, at least not in Colorado. If we had a test port in the chamber, I would have plugged it in there. Sometimes we'll have a plastic plug, which means the HVAC technician put that in there to check it. Then you can put your probe in there. You're more towards the source. It's a little more accurate. I'm not going to make a hole to do that, though. Now this is something I like to do, it's not a requirement. Some people will tell you you should never do it. Uh, if I can find a place where the vent pipe is loose, I'll take a screw out and I'll put my probe up there so I can actually see what our combustion gases are. Uh, high carbon monoxide levels there indicate a furnace that's not set up correctly or it can be a bad furnace. So it's something I like to do. Although I will not damage a vent to do it, I won't take apart tape. Uh, at a 90% efficient furnace with a plastic PVC, you go outside and do it. But uh, whenever possible, I check this. Now, this furnace is shaking pretty good with it when the blower came on. We weren't running a filter. I suspect we have a lot of lint built up on that squirrel cage, so that's why we're shaking so much. Now we'll let that go for a while. <clears throat> uh, we like to see below 50. Really, we like to see below 25 parts per million on carbon monoxide. The gas company will shut them down at 400. So they allow quite a bit. Uh, Anything above 100, usually a service will pay for itself in gas savings. Uh, so you need to look at those numbers. Some people are saying at 40 and 50 we should have it serviced, and that's a recommendation, but uh, you know, it's really not a fault, it's not a failure, so you have to take, be a little careful on that. This one's burning 10 parts per million right now. 
which is very clean. We're real happy with that. Uh, can't complain. It needs to be serviced. We need to have the, the squirrel cage cleaned definitely from the shaking. But uh, they're not going to set it up any better. It's running pretty clean, pretty efficiently. Now before it gets too hot, I'm going to go upstairs and check, make sure I have heat at each register. Uh, you can bend over and feel it. You can use an uh, infrared uh, thermometer. Either way, you want to make sure you have flow. If we have a restriction somewhere and the room doesn't get any heat or any AC, uh, they're not going to be too happy with the house. This is also where we're going to notice that the uh, doors were co contacting the carpet. The rooms will flow real nice if we leave the doors open. If you should close a room, you'd have very minimal uh, heat in that room. Okay, now we're down to the laundry in the basement. We already know there's a problem with this dryer electrical. We know it's double tapped. We can't do that. Uh, I'm still going to check it, see if it's operational, uh, even though I'm going to note that there's a wiring problem. And yes, it is wired correctly. So at least they did that part right. Uh, dryer venting goes outside. That's good. Over here, water source, securely connected. We're OK with that. They used a Studer vent is what they used on this. So they do have it vented, uh, which is something that's very critical. We have a crawl space over here. I'm going to have to take the covers off so we can get into the crawl space see what we have going there. We should have one dryer vent for the other laundry facility should be coming out here. So we're going to look, make sure they take that outside. Whenever you go in a crawl space or an attic, first thing you take the cover off, step back and look around. Don't just immediately jump in. Sometimes somebody will have exposed wires hanging down. A lot of times in the attic, there was supposed to be a light fixture that didn't get put in there. You may not have wire nuts. You may come up and hit yourself in the head with a load of wire. So you need to take, take a little precautions. The other thing is rodents. Some of the older houses will have skunks, will have raccoons, different things that made it in the crawl space. So you want to step back, look a little bit. Take a quick peek, kind of orientate yourself. We look pretty good here, so I'm going to go ahead and climb in. Now right here is the toilet stack that was loose, the one that was loose. We're not leaking any, so that's good. Still want to recommend a wax seal, but uh, it hasn't caused any wood damage yet. ABS plumbing throughout, that's good. Uh, we have our dryer vent here. We wanted to make sure it went out to an exterior wall, and it does. We do have a vapor barrier. Um, we always recommend a vapor barrier. It helps control moisture. Uh, can cause some problems if we don't have one. Several years they didn't put them in. I like to recommend them. We're looking at insulation on the foundation walls. That's a good thing. That'll help minimize our costs. Some extra old wire in here. I'm just looking to see if we have any crawl space vents that are covered up. I don't remember on the, any on the back wall, but we want to check. Uh, typically, we'd like crawl space venting. If we have no crawl space venting, I'd be recommending that we put some kind of vent on that door to try and help control moisture levels in here also. This is the area underneath the fireplace. Here's our gas line to the fireplace. And we'll come back and sniff that. We should look at our beam pockets, see if there's any signs of movement. That's a good indication for the foundation wall, especially when we can't see a lot of it because of the insulation. Okay, we're nice and dry. Things look good here except for that solid uh, cover for the crawl space. I think I'd be putting a event in there. No mold, no black substance, no white substance. Uh, the floor is looking good. I can see where they've liquid nailed the uh, the floor, so that'll help keep it quiet. Besides screwing it, they they glued it. A little unconventional beam structure here, but it's been there since the house was built, and it hasn't moved, so we're looking pretty good shape. It's a micro lamb, uh, just a little different the way they used a four by four instead of a steel post. 
but uh, they've insulated the uh, hot water line in here. So uh, all in all, we're looking pretty good. Okay, when you're doing a ladder, you should really wear personal protection when you're going in the attic or tight crawl space. Uh, it's awful easy to get in there and then think maybe I should have had it. Be halfway in, I'll, I'll just forget about it. We have some pretty bad fumes up there. We have dust. We have mice droppings. We have a lot of things in there. So it doesn't take too long to throw one of these on. They're not greatly comfortable, but you're only up there for five minutes. So try to get in the habit of that. It could uh, save you some, some big problems. I took off my mask just so we could talk here. Uh, when you're in an attic, we should look at several things. Venting, we have some gable vents. We have roof vents. When I look down, we're going to see if we have soffit vents that are open. A lot of times insulation will be covering the soffit vents. We want to look at trusses or rafters, whichever may be the course. Make sure we have our cords. Make sure if we have any green tags requesting uh, lateral bracing. We have lateral bracing. I don't see any here required. Uh, Make sure our trusses aren't damaged. Sometimes they'll get damaged by a forklift or HVAC technician might cut a cord out to make room for a duct. If we see anything like that, we need to call out for a structural engineer to recertify the truss. Uh, look for correct insulation. Uh, I see over here we have a recessed light. They have taken the insulation away from the light. We want a three inch clearance minimum on most lights. So we want to look at things like that. Uh, we have approximately 12 inches of insulation, which would be pretty good coverage. Uh, newer homes are 15, but this should be okay for the age of the house. Going to look down here at the vaulted ceiling. Be very careful when you're walking, because if you slip, you will go through the drywall. I wanted to look at that furnace flue to see if it looked okay going down, and it looks great here. So that looks to me like exterior rusting, which isn't a big issue. If we had seen rusting continuing down through the crawl space here, we'd know some place we had a separation on our double wall piping. So we look okay there. At the front here, we can see some air space with our soffit vents. That's allowing cooler air to come in and help push some of the warm air out. So our venting situation looks pretty good. Here we have our third can light, and they pulled the insulation back. We have wire clamps on it. We look pretty good. Uh, all in all up here, you know, we're looking pretty, pretty usual. Uh, we have gusset plates. All our cords look to be intact. Our bathroom fan goes out through the, the roof here. Uh, we don't have attic access to the other vault, so it's only a partial attic, but it's still looking pretty good. Over here, we have our vent coming up here. We checked our vents from the exterior, but on the inside, we want to look. They look good. They look like they're going properly. Here it says we have about 12 inches of insulation. I usually take a picture of that from my memory. I also take a picture of the trusses, just so I remember that there were trusses, not rafters, 2 by 4 construction, things like that. Uh, we actually have, on the back vault side, we have 2 by 6 truss. On the front, we have 2 by 4 truss. So when I document it, I usually do the smallest of the bunch, and I'll say 2 by 4 construction. No really new wiring, uh, except for the can lights, and those look good. Uh, so what we can see, we look good up here. What we do with our clients is usually the morning following the inspection, we give them an email inspection. Then we send them a hard copy, which this is theirs, custom printed. This is a sample inspection. I let my clients know that anytime they see any information from us, it's either one of my houses, my rental houses, we never share anything. Uh, Privacy Act, we don't want to have any of our clients' information out there for anybody to see. <clears throat> so our inspections start with a picture of the house, an invoice in the contract, which I explained to them. First page is a summary. Some people don't use summaries. If you don't, then you won't have one. But we use the summary for the big items, health and safety issues. Uh, that's a personal call. Depending on the software you use, you may or not use it. After that, we have a checklist. There's two heating sections. The second one is where we place the furnace model number, serial number. That way, when they call to get that service, they don't have to take the furnace apart and look for it. It's all right here. We also uh, provide uh, defect photos. 
And that's how I explain it. I used to keep the defects that show a good pitcher. The only exception to that is my last pitcher is always the main water shutoff valve. That way they start off the water instead of the sprinkler system when they're trying to work on their house. We include a standard practice for Nashi and Nashi. Uh, this one happens to say Nashi, it's an older one. Uh, I explain to them, refrigerators, things like that aren't part of standards practice. We look at them as courtesy. We also include a home tips book that's English and Spanish, has a section on most things in the house. Uh, we have our stuff all custom printed, so we buy them in components and put them together. Uh, if you buy 500 at a time, the cost isn't too bad. If you try to buy 25 or 50, it's kind of prohibited to have your own uh, printing, so you do something like this. Now here's where I'd ask my client, make sure that we have the correct address, email, contact information, so there's no chance that we uh, send it to the wrong place or they don't get it. We include a thank you, a pen, we have letter openers, a business brochure here. Uh, this is kind of your last chance to shine in front of the client. So you want to show them as much as you can. Uh, we keep pretty busy because of some of the things we do. It costs you a little more money to do this. Each binder, including shipping, is about $25. So that's part of your cost of doing business. Yeah, we could save $25 each one, but uh, our clients really like that. They keep this a lot longer than they keep an email version. Keeps us going. There's contact information in there. I've gone up to neighborhoods where they passed out all those cards to their neighbors. So uh, especially on like a one-year warranty inspection, you tend to get a lot of business out of that same neighborhood because they're all new houses. Uh, that is what we provide. Uh, we have taken a lot of photos. Usually a client will only get 20 to 30 photos. Uh, we keep all the others for our backup memories. Uh, I do not provide those to the clients. Don't offer to provide those to the clients. Most of them would mean nothing to the client because they're pictures of me taking space. They mean something to me, not them. So uh, that's, some people will put it on a disc. We've had clients ask us to put the inspection on a disc. It's very easy to do, but uh, that's all your business decision. You decide what you want to do. And again, I'm Jim Crum, owner of Colorado's Best Home Inspections. Thanks for being with us today. Uh, wish you well in your business venture. It is a good business if you work it. Thank you.